Gary Newman has just performed his thousandth gig here in London, in Camden, at the Electric Ballroom. I was there. Let's talk all about it. A very warm welcome to you, my friend, wherever you may be in the world. This is going to be an in-depth video, so sit tight. But do stick around till the end, because if you're a Depeche Mode fan, you're not going to want to miss what I'm about to tell you. Uh, for sneak preview, I've teamed up with photographer Brian Griffin, and we are about to release a Depeche Mode photography book all about Brian's photography with Depeche Mode. I've also teamed up with producer Gareth Jones, and we're about to do an event in the 13th of June here in London. And this will be a breakdown of all the multi-track stems from the Construction Time Again album. I've also been recruited by the industrial rock band Mesh, and I will be on tour with them at the end of this month, which is April 2023. And I'll be playing keyboards for them for two shows in Germany. So if that's of interest to you, then we'll talk about that at the end of the show. For now, though, let's talk about the thousandth gig which Gary Newman has just completed. Now, this was done in the electric ballroom here in Camden, and there were three shows. They were, they were 998, 999, and 1000. So when he announced this, I was like, wow, okay, that's great. I'm definitely going to go, because you guys know I'm a huge Gary Newman fan. And I was a bit sloppy, because I thought I left it a bit long. I didn't realize how quickly the tickets would sell out. To cut long story short, I could not get a ticket, but... I managed to get one uh, the day before, at the very last minute, thanks to someone who couldn't make it. So I was glad I got a ticket. Um, there were some comments made by fans, uh, you know, why did he choose such a small venue? And I suppose you, you could argue, you know, he, it's quite nice to say I've sold out three nights. I mean, it's Gary Newman, so he, you know, he's played some, he's now bigger than he's ever been. Um, so he could have quite easily booked shows like, you know, uh, Brixton Academy and, and things like that. But, you know, so, some fans had, as people always do have comments on everything, um, some people commented on, you know, why, the, why did you choose such a small venue? Anyway, that's besides the point. Um, in this breakdown of the show, which I'm going to go through, um, I will not only be talking about the show, but I'll be giving you insights as they come to me. This is a discussion channel. I'm not a music journalist and we do not cater to 15 second mentalities. That's why I'm not on TikTok and that's why my videos are long. So what did I think of the show? Now I'm going to be brutally honest. Just because I'm a fan of yours doesn't mean I won't be brutally honest. But I will come at this honestly and openly and I'll give you my opinions and bearing in mind everything you hear here is just my opinion. You do not have to agree with me. Now the set list I'm going to read to you is obviously from the 15th of April. This was the show I was, I was at and this was the thousandth show. So I was very honored to be a part of that and glad I managed to get a ticket. But before we jump into the, the track listing, it's worth mentioning the support act for this tour, which of course was Gary's daughter Raven, who is now, you know, uh, releasing her own music. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't listened to anything um, but I was, you know, it, it, the fact that Aid Fenton's involved, it didn't surprise me, you know, it, and, uh, you know, she's lucky to be having someone of that caliber to be helping her produce, because Aid, as I've said, is, I think he's one of the most outstanding producers in the genre working at the moment. Unfortunately, I missed the support act. Now, uh, I got, uh, as I say, I got these tickets last minute, and I got information during the day that Gary was coming on an hour earlier. Usually at Newman shows, Gary usually comes on at nine, but he was coming on at eight o'clock and that was because the electric ballroom venue was having a club night. So everything was pushed back and or pushed forward an hour earlier. So, which means I missed the support act and I was gutted about that. Um, I was in contact with Aid yesterday, just, you know, via text and, um, uh, we he did say I should check out some of the YouTube footage now bearing in mind YouTube footage is usually filmed on you know smartphones so despite the fact that the only way I saw this was via camera phone footage on YouTube I was pleasantly surprised as I say I've not really been paying attention I you know to Raven's solo music but it was great to listen to it 
And I was very, very surprised to hear her voice. I think her voice is kind of beyond her years in age. What is she, what is Raven now? 20 years old? She's got a really, really mature um, and a very agile, a very uh, a fluid voice. You know, it's very, very sensitive. And I I was impressed with what I heard on, on YouTube, and I will be checking it out more. It was great to see Aid Fenton on stage again. Aid's still looking great, rocking those keyboards. And I'm, Aid hasn't been on stage for a while, so I'm sure he's enjoyed it. And... S- Really, just from what I saw from YouTube there, I I was impressed. I think, you know, there is always that, I've spoken about this before, people are always going things like, oh, yeah, you know, it's it's Gary's daughter, you know. And so this is something I've spoken about in previous videos. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword when you have a famous parent. You know, you you kind of have to try harder because people tend to be saying, oh, you're just there because of the grace of your parents. But, you know, me being an honest straight shooter, I've been very impressed by what I've heard so far, and so I will be looking forward to hearing more of that. So gutted that I missed the support act, but um, I'm sure I will be seeing a live show from her at some point. So Newman's band come on at five past eight, as I say, which is usually an hour earlier than the typical Newman time slot. Starting off with, you know, it always starts with like bass and screaming, like tearing of the... It looks like the you know the screen is tearing and always a dramatic entrance. I mean, Gary's one hell of a showman, and I've always loved that about him. The instrumental resurrection was what started, and of course you have the band members walking on one at a time, and then of course we go straight into down in the park, and then the great man walks on himself. <laughs> That typical anthemic Newman feel-good sound. I must sort of say, so far as set lists go, you know, for set lists are hard. I've spoken about this in my Depeche Mode uh, uh, reviews recently. Depeche Mode just released Memento Mori. They're on tour. And it's very difficult when you've been going for 40 years to actually, you know, you're doing a show of 20 songs and you want to not only promote your new music, but you also want to, you know, pay homage to the older songs. You know, and, and the fans very often want to hear the older songs. I must say, I think, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure opinions will vary as they do, this was a very, very good set list. I think Gary's very good at sort of, you know, playing his new stuff and playing the old stuff because we know that Gary hates nostalgia. You know, he's very much focused on his new stuff. But he does pay respect to the fans by giving them what they want. And, you know, starting off with Down in the Park was, yeah, it's such an unusual and great track. I think everyone will agree. He then goes on to track two, which was Haunted. That, of course, from the Jagged album. Haven't heard that one live in a long time. And what a great track. Gary is really... He, he, what, I, what I love about him is it's all about power and the wall of sound and, you know, the, the big anthemic chorus. And, it, you know, it's all there. And uh, it, was, it was great to hear that. Track three, Remind Me to Smile. You know, then you, you see the, the, the sort of more uh, the older audience or the people have been following him from the beginning really getting excited by that. Track four, The Gift. There we go. That's a track from the latest Intruder album. And uh, I do like hearing the, excuse me for being geeky, the CR78. Shout out to Aid Fenton for, as Gary said, sneaking that in. Um, and as Aid Fenton said, if you watch the interview I did with him, Aid said, we haven't heard a CR78 used in Gary Newman albums for years. So he, he, he decided to sneak that in. And in the interview I did with Gary and Aid, Gary was... <laughs> joking saying yeah aid you're always trying to sneak all this old shit in and blah 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 but uh, uh all jokes aside um it was done well um it's not only an iconic sort of retro sound but it was done in a way that suits it it wasn't put in just to you know be there it actually suited the song so anyway well done and i am um, i'm getting a bit geeky now we then come on to track six another legacy classic <laughs> I don't know if I'm playing in the right key there, but you know, doom, doo, doom, doo. Uh, it just has such a brutal sort of like simplistic bass line, but with such power. Absolutely love it. 
Seven, there we go. My Shadow in Vain, followed by That's Too Bad. Great to hear some of the Tubeway Army tracks thrown in. And they go down really, really well. And typically, I don't think every time, but obviously um, a lot of these songs are played with backing tracks. They need to be because of the, you know, the production style and everything. But typically, from what I could gather, most of the sort of Tubeway Army songs that he does in shows, they're kind of done 100% live. And, th- and that's quite nice, you know, uh, it just proving once again that this band are very competent and they're not, you know, they're not only relying on backing tracks. Um, and also the fact that, you know, the, the set alters between f- sort of full on songs with backing tracks and then sort of goes to songs which are less metronomic and more sort of. Um, you know played live without the aid of backing tracks this gives it this gives the show a nice dynamic and a kind of a nice feel yeah it it kind of changes that it goes from sort of like a heavy produced sound to a sort of a more sort of rock uh, or more sort of um jamming kind of vibe if you know what i mean so gary's band has been together with him for a long time and they're very very experienced and you know proving once again that you know that they are very very good musicians um that's too bad. Oh, wow, well, that's too bad. Do, 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 do. That's really, really, f- very. that's a very, very fast bass line. Um, just, uh, yeah, absolutely. Track nine was Exile. And I haven't heard this one in a long time. Um, quite a long song from the, um, what was the album called? The, yeah, from the Exile album, yeah. Uh, so I guess the feature track from the Exile album. I'll make everyone pay. Some things you can't forgive. I'll make everyone pay. I don't want to segue or go too much off topic now, but I've mentioned before that Gary and Aid are working on the re-release of Sacrifice, Exile and Pure. Those are three albums that are being re-recorded and I believe that Jagged is being mixed again. So it's not being re-recorded, it's just being mixed again by Aid. But Sacrifice, Exile and Pure are being reproduced from scratch again which is an interesting concept because you know gary being a guy that doesn't like to look back he only looks forward so it's it's uh, and some of you have asked you know why would he do that and it's interesting because if we look at sacrifice uh, that really was the album that really sort of got him back on track because you know he went through that dodgy period where he was kind of losing his way and everything and you know to segue even more um, I was talking to a fan uh, at the at the concert, and um, he was agreeing that, you know, even the sort of the dodgy period, like the Machine and Soul album, I, I too, I have a soft spot for that album. I don't really think it was as bad as what Gary says it is, but, um, you know, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a period that he chose to forget. But certainly from the point of sacrifice, that was the point where he really sort of found himself again he decided to make music for himself as opposed to trying to give you know trying to be successful it was just a record he did for himself using a porter studio and sm50 was it an sm50 an sm58 mic it was just a very very basic setup and the the sacrifice album really and even the exile album they've really got a real sort of like demo like quality to them i mean certainly if you compare them sonically to the latter records they just don't you know stand up sonically however this is something that i've been um not not critical about but when gary and aid re-release sacrifice exile and pure i do hope that it retains a lot of that vibe because very often you know when i'm coaching producers i often have to tell them that it's not so much about the technical sound, sonic sound of the record, because as a producer, that's what, what you always go for. Uh, what people tend to connect with you know, is the atmosphere and the vibe. So whereas it's easy to criticize Sacrifice and Exile, you know, so far as by today's standards, as far as production is concerned, I do think it is, it is the vibe and the essence that was captured of Newman at that time that is completely magical. And this is why a lot of artists do this. I remember just randomly, uh, just a random example, hearing Nick Kershaw's, what's that song? Wouldn't it be good to be in your shoes? I heard a version on Spotify where he, I was listening to it and I thought, this is not the original. So he, he'd re-recorded it. And although it was more technical, um, he had lost some of the the essence of the original. So 
that might just be nostalgia, but I don't want to go off topic here. All I'm saying is I'm sure Gary and Aid are going to do a great job on the re-release of these three albums. But um, just understand that as a fan, I think that there is a there is beauty in imperfection. And uh, some have said maybe we should just leave those albums where they are. Um, it's a view, but of course I would like to see them brought up in line with the new sound and I'm excited to see that. So watch this space. We're going to get involved and we're going to go deep into that when it happens. Um, the next track was Splinter and it says here, first performance since 2018. Okay. We then go on to a showstopper. <laughs> Cars, of course. I think they play it without... I think this is played without a backing track. I'm, uh, was it? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, which just gives it that real sort of live, sort of early Newman sound. Once again, as I said, a lot of the uh, the Tube by Army stuff was sort of just done live without any backing tracks, which really pays homage to that period and the source material. Is the world not enough was track 13... And of course, you know, one of the newest songs, you know, well done, great atmosphere, really brutal hard sound. Track 13, In a Dark Place, once again, um, you know, fitting in well with the set. Uh, 14, Here in the Black, oh my God, <laughs> this track is fucking epic. Um, I've said this before on my Gary Newman videos is... Very often, and I'm not going to mention other bands, you know, typically with bands that have been around this long, they tend to go, oh, here's a new song. And you're like, oh, please, can you just play the hits? We don't care about your new music. With Gary, that's not the case. His new music is really, really good. And it is interesting. Okay, Here in the Black is not one of the most recent songs, but it is a newish song. And it goes down so well. You know, it, it goes down just as well as, you know, our friends Electric and, you know, some of his classic older song so he still has the knack of being able to you know write good songs right track 15 the chosen once again great track and then 16 my name is ruin and uh, i've mentioned this before it is quite it is quite funny to see um well not funny but it makes me feel old when i see <laughs> when i see uh, Persia coming onto stage because you know when she first came on she was like this height and I joked with Gary when I interviewed him I said you know w w with every new tour she got taller and taller and taller now of course she's a she's a beautiful fully grown woman and uh, you know it's 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 great to see that he's still including the family in the tour and great that she was able to join him for uh, my name is Ruin and I I think I've been lucky because certainly I. Uh, all, all the gigs I've been to, because I, I tend to go to all the sort of like the, the, the major sort of milestone gigs, and every gig I've been to, uh, Persia has been on stage with him. So when she's not on stage and not able to perform, then obviously her vocal will be on the backing track, and it, it always feels like something's missing. So I'm always, always glad to see Persia on stage performing that song with Gary. We then go on to 17, I Die, You Die. There we go. Also an... You know, one of, one of the classic legacy songs. We then have the encore, and then we're straight on to You Knew It Was Coming, A Prayer for the Unborn. And I have some criticism on this. Before I get to that, I just want to say it is a great, great, simplistically, anthemically brilliant, brilliant tune. Like Gary, this, it, the, the ideas are simple, but they are brilliant. They're so effective. <laughs> just so powerful now Gary aid please 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 and I'm saying this this comes from a place of love could we please have a different version of this song <laughs> uh, the version of course which we've been hearing for the last 20 years is the Andy Gray remix now listen it's a great great remix but I just feel after 20 years, um, I'm not saying lose it from the set list. I love the song. Um, I just think uh, 
I'm a, and I, uh, many fans have said this as well, and I don't mean any disrespect out by this, but we're a bit bored with this version. Um, I would like to hear, and I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've not heard the actual album version from the Pure album from 2000. The the actual album version. I was listening to that this morning actually, and I just thought, wow, it's a great version. It has a lot more sort of groove and everything. Now I'm not hating on this version. It is a great version. I'm just saying. You know, we've been hearing it for about 20 years now, and I think a different rendition would be appreciated. Uh, it was a little bit like uh, Down in the Park. It always started with that, and you're like, oh, okay, here it comes again. Now, I'm happy to say they've since given us a new backing track of Down in the Park, and it usually starts off with um, that resurrection um instrumental and then it goes straight into down in the park so they've changed that and that was great i was a little bit critical as well in my recent depeche mode memento mori tour uh review and i I also said you know depeche mode did that as well they were like doing using the same backing tracks that they've used for a long time and it it gets a bit stale you know so i just feel guys with with respect love the song by all means you know i don't want to see it go from the set list because it is really i mean just playing those chords those, those notes you can see what a powerful Newman classic song. It just, I just feel it just needs to, it just needs to be reworked. I'm bored of this version, guys, and I can't say it any other way. Love the song, but please, can we have another version? Okay. Then, of course, you knew it was coming. We're going to end with Our Friends Electric. Uh, ta-da, the song with a wrong note, so to speak. Uh, once again, as well, the same backing track being used. For a long time, uh, but yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hammer home on that. Um, what did I think of the show in general? Well, you know, Newman never ever disappoints. I always said, and I said this to him when I interviewed him. I said, you always perform like it's your last show. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he he puts his heart and soul into it. Uh, a lot of the sort of artists who are the same age as Newman who, you know, tend to be doing legacy you know, uh, performances, they're not releasing new music. And with a lot of them, I'm not going to mention uh, names, with a lot of them, there's always this element of, oh, we're going to the motion, she has the next song. Not this guy. He he. Gary is always so hungry. He's always so energetic. He said during his speech, he's done a thousand, and he said he's going to, I'm paraphrasing now, but he said he's going he's gonna to try his hardest to get to 2,000. But, you know, the way this guy's going is I... You know, he he just has such sincerity, sincerity and enthusiasm, and you just feel it with everything. There's there's no there's no half heartedness about his performances, and that's what I've always loved about him as an artist. Now, this being a live performance, of course, it wasn't without flaws, and I like to hear mistakes when I watch a band because it it you know it shows it's honest and sincere. And um, you know, there were a few mistakes that I'm sure a lot of people probably didn't notice, and I'm not going to bang on about them. Uh, uh, I, th- I think it was it w- was it the song Metal where uh, I think Gary said at the end he said he said oh I fucked up oh, j- just to th- just in case you don't think I didn't notice so you know he messed up and yeah, w- there were a few bum notes and stuff which I'm sure might be uh, corrected because they they were filming this I saw you know at the top there quite an impressive array of cameras that were filming this so this will obviously res- uh, I assume be you know, releasing some, they, they will be releasing some kind of uh, DVD or or um, recorded version. Now, I don't know if if the other if, if gigs nine ninety eight and nine ninety nine were filmed as well, um, because uh, a lot of bands do that this day these days. They will they will film five or six different shows and then they'll sort of put them all together, take the best songs and sort of you know make a, comp- a composite of the best performances um I, I don't know if that's the case i don't know if if, if gigs 998 and 999 were filmed as well um, but this show was definitely filmed and it would be nice to see all the flaws uh going in there now ha- having said that they weren't like terrible mistakes they were just mistakes which happen you know which were synonymous with the live show uh there was nothing terrible but uh it was great and i want to actually just give a shout out to i had to write his name down uh, is it Jimmy Le, Jimmy Lasudo? Sorry, yeah, Jimmy Les, Jimmy Lasido. Sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, he, of course, is the new drummer who's taken over from Richard Beasley. I know a lot of people were sad to see Richard go because Richard's been in the band since 1993, and 
it's not only the musicianship of losing a band member that's been in the band that long. It's also the camaraderie, you know. You, you, you become like a family. I mean, imagine being in the band since 1993. That's, what's that? That's, that's 30 years ago. So it's a long time. So, But I also feel for the new drummer, Jimmy, who's joined now because there's a tremendous amount of pressure because there's always going to be those people that go, oh, he's not as good as Richie. Oh, he's not as good as Richie. I just want to say, you know, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan, but I always speak my mind. I believe in being honest. To be fair, I think this, I, I think Jimmy has, has done a great job. I mean, you know, it's, he, he's authentic to the, to the sound. Um, you know, he's obviously studied Richard and, you know, studied the music and, I just, I just think it was great. I think maybe musicians would probably hear that, okay, this is a different... I think the run-of-the-mill fan, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, they probably wouldn't even notice if they were... They probably wouldn't even notice that, you know, it was a different drummer. Um, there is a different style that, that I'm getting um, because he's human and, and, and he's an artist, so there would be a different style. But uh, so far as, you know technical ability and everything i i think i think he was one hell of a drummer i think it sounded great and i'm gunning for you jimmy um because i know it's very difficult when you stand in for someone because you've always got the people going oh it's not as good so i think um i think the drumming was great and in, indeed the whole performance uh, i never have any uh, complaints a comment usually on the sound you know, I remember seeing him at the Royal Albert Hall and the sound quality, quality there was amazing. Of course, you know, that is, your sound is always subordinate to the laws of physics, depending on the, the venue you're in. And the electric ballroom, I, I found it very quite narrow and claustrophobic, but I did like the kind of sort of like uh, industrial kind of vibe and stuff. I, I think Gary's possibly too big to play in a place like that you know he's, he's he's bigger than that but then again i would rather see an artist performing in a venue that size as opposed to stadium acts because i'm going to go see depeche mode in a stadium act and i'm not really a, a fan of stadiums just because you you lose a lot of sound and I, I just don't like that you know you're like miles away from the stage so electric ballroom yeah i've i've never been there before uh, it was a, it you know it was it was a good show the sound was good and it's you know it's it's as once again the, the the venue kind of and the shape of the the venue and everything dictates you're at the mercy of physics as to how loud you can push it and of course with venues like that it does sometimes get to a point where it just gets so loud because it's like it's, it gets a bit shouty but Performance-wise and everything, I think they were spot on, and I really enjoyed it, and I was happy to be a part of it. Have we covered everything? Yes. One more thing before we get on to the uh, news I wanted to share with you. I see Gary has announced at the end of this year, around about October, he's doing a series of acoustic shows. Now, that's very, very interesting because, you know, he's done the whole orchestra thing and everything now, and it's quite fascinating that he's chosen to do some acoustic shows um, because let's face it with Gary Newman there is a lot of smoke and mirrors and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way I don't mean that as if though oh he's hiding behind smoke and mirrors I don't mean that at all because of the way his music is presented uh, you know it's it's a, when you're an artist performing it's showmanship it's theater so it it needs the makeup and the lights and all that kind of stuff and because it is very sort of reliant on special effects and lights and stuff like that, it will be very interesting to see those songs stripped down to acoustic renditions. Um, I've done that a lot in this channel where I would take famous songs and I strip them down to a piano sound. But what's fascinating about Gary Newman's music is, uh, you will notice, if you remember the interview I did with David Brooks, David Brooks explained that in all the years that he's been playing keyboards for Gary, he's never actually played a chord. Now, if you're a pianist or a keyboardist, you will understand what that means. And that is really, typically, keyboards for Gary Newman's music, there are no chords being played. So, as David said, he would typically, with every song, um, or most songs, he would be playing a, an octave in the left hand and then just a melody in the right hand, you know, uh, typically in a song like, uh, I don't know, Replicas. So 
So, if you're a keyboardist, you'll understand that there's no chord being played. It's just a melody, and then you're you're kind of rooting the bass notes with an octave. Um, once again, very much like classical music, it's just written one line at a time. And then the sort of cordial information that comes across in the song is made up by the layers, whether it be the guitar playing different a uh, different note, and that will thereby add the third or the fifth. And also, just just a uh, 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 David also mentioned a lot of the um, the guitars, I believe, are power chords and things like that. And and Gary has rules in the um, the percussion as well. I think there's no 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 is it no no riding hats and you know things like that. So and these are all small things that actually make up the the sound. And they're and they're all very important, even though they are quite small things. They you know it is the cumulative adding of all these small things which give it the overall sort of like sound that it is so the reason i'm saying this uh, is not to get sound like a smart ass or, <laughs> or to get completely geeky it's just that when they get to the acoustic shows it'll be very interesting to see how the songs are presented now i often in this channel i like to break down full songs usually from bands like Depeche Mode and play them on a piano because i always say that when you strip away the synthesizers and electronics you can hear how beautiful the songs are, uh, and they're not reliant on technology. Now, as I said, Gary Newman's music typically is very, there are a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's, you know, there, there's lights and there's makeup and all that kind of stuff. So stripping it back to acoustics uh, is challenging, but it will actually, it, it, it will actually show the strength of the songs. And uh, obviously the songs will be presented completely differently. I mean, typically, if we take that sort of sustained Newman string sound, which is typically... Now, if that is just played note for note on a piano, it doesn't really work. Because with the nature of a piano, obviously the sound decays. Um, now, I don't know if they're going to be using an organ or a piano. So obviously if they do use a piano, they would probably do something more like this. You, you need to add more movement, you know, if, if you're using a piano sound. It'll be interesting to see the way they do it. and. You know, due to the anthemic nature of the songs, like um, it'll be very interesting to see how they come across acoustically. So as you can see, it's not reliant on smoke and mirrors. Even if, you, even if you strip it down to just an acoustic piano, because the songs are fundamentally good, they can stand their own. getting carried away but you can see how they're very melodic so they're not reliant on the synthesizer so it'll be really interesting to see and once again Gary's band are very very competent musicians so I will definitely look forward to seeing what they do there and it will be Newman as you've never heard him before so I'm I'm a fanboy so I'll be really excited have we covered everything I think we have I want to invite you my friend to leave your comments in the description below and let me know, were you at one of these shows, 998, 999, 1000? I'm sure there are some of you that went to all three. And if you did go to all three, then I particularly want to hear from you and just let me know, you know, how did the shows compare? And if so, which show did you 
uh, enjoy the most, which one went across better. Also, what did you think of Raven doing her debut appearance uh, as a support for, for Gary? Let me know. I would really love to know. Right, so in the beginning of the video, I was telling you about some breaking news that I just wanted to share with you. And I'll go into a little bit more detail here. As you know, photographer Brian Griffin, who has photographed the first five Depeche Mode album covers, he has been a regular contributor to this channel, and we've done quite a lot of work together. Uh, we are now going to be releasing a Depeche Mode photographic book now. It's going to be the complete collection of Brian Griffin's photographic work of Depeche Mode. It, in it includes you know, photos you've never seen before, uh, some scans of the original transparencies. This was really because I wanted something that I as a fan could hold in my hands and say, well, this is a full uh, set of Brian Griffin Depeche Mode photography because we haven't had that yet. So that is what we have decided to do. Um, the crowdfunder for that will start at the beginning of May and it will run through the duration of May. Once again, this is a crowdfunding project we do not have a publisher. Brian and I will be doing this completely uh, off our own backs as we do with our poster print business. And uh, if you like this idea, then I will um, be giving you the details soon how you can support this crowdfunder. Remember, with crowdfunding, if we reach our target, it will go ahead. If we don't, it won't. So it's entirely up to you. Uh, no pressure. Uh, but I would love to see it happen. Um, also, on June the 13th, I've teamed up with Gareth Jones, who obviously produced, uh, you know, three of Depeche Mode's greatest albums, Construction Time Again, Some Great Reward, and Black Celebration. And this was also me wanting to, uh, you know, be a part of something that had never been done before. And this will be the first time Gareth Jones will actually be in a room presenting the multi-track stems to Construction Time Again. And we're going to have a quad, quad system set up you know, so two speakers in the front, two speakers at the back. So you can hear these songs in a way you've never heard them before. And Gareth will be stripping them down into their separate parts. Um, it'll be a first of its kind event. And this will be at the Strong Room, once again, London, the 13th of June. The links to buy tickets will be at the bottom in the description here below. There are limited tickets, so get in there quickly because um, this is a first of its kind event. That all really, and oh, actually, I've also been recruited by the band Mesh to play keyboards for them. I haven't had much time. I've had to learn 19 of their songs, and I will be on stage with them at two festival gigs in Germany on the 29th and the 30th of April. So if you're there, to my German subscribers and fans, I'd love to see you there. I'm honored to be playing keyboards for Mesh. I, I, I really am a fan of their music. And I did interview them back in 2018. So I was honored to be asked to play a gig for them. Uh, and I'm not joining the band. I'm just stepping in for their keyboardist who was not able to make this gig. But I'm really, I'm a bit nervous because obviously it's a lot to take on. But um, I'm very excited too. My friends, thank you so much. If this is your first time to the channel, I'm welcoming you with open arms and asking you to please consider subscribing. You can also join the Vaughan George Facebook group, which is a great way to connect with other members of this community where we discuss the videos on this channel. And if you would like to really support me and get become a part of my inner circle, then please do consider subscribing to watchvg.com, which is a members-only subscription service uh, where you can see in-depth versions of my videos, but also it helps support me in what I'm doing here. Thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate your support and I will see you at an event or on the next video. Lots of love. Adios.